This is Duke University. So let me begin my um, opening comments this year with a gesture to last year's Feminist Theory Workshop and to mark that one of our keynote speakers last year has since passed away. Jose Esteban Munoz was a good friend to many of you at this conference and at Duke more generally where he received his PhD. And his passing was a huge loss to many of you personally, of course, and also to our field. Writing of Isaac Julian's film, Looking for Langston, he wrote, communal mourning by its very nature is an immensely complicated text to read, for we do not mourn just one lost object or other, but we also mourn as a whole, or put another way, as a contingent and temporary collection of fragments that is experiencing a loss of its parts, mourning for oneself, for one's community, for one's very history, a response to the heterosexist and corporate task-oriented mourning. In quoting and invoking Jose here, I am not trying to assume, I should say, any privileged role a friend. I knew Jose, Jose only, only a little. We had met just a few times, um, but were not in that realm that one might call friendship, um, more um, uh, colleagues. Um, and in citing Jose, I think we can pose a question with Freud and Penelope Deutscher and Derrida on the issue of loss and mourning that is not necessarily marked by friendship. Deutsche, in the article provided as reading for the seminar, asks us to consider how mourning provokes the question of what the other we have lost has been to us. In reading A Rigore with Derrida, a question, posed, um, she, she, a question is posed concerning difference or sexual difference within the realm of friendship, and in particular in philosophies of friendship, as well as in various cultures of ritual mourning, when the injunction to mourn is often tied to the familial or the community injunction of lineage, inheritance, the consanguinal, many of which ironically enter the moments of academic deaths or rites of mourners, of firstborns, etc., in our less than modern profession, in which the private and public seep into each other in the structure of the homosocial. For Deutsche, reading Derrida and Irigaray together, an interruptive and generative entanglement on the nature of sexual difference, mourning, the homosocial, and the heterosexual, recalls also an earlier point of engagement with the theorization of queer, or is it feminine, mourning, and its challenge to ontology. In 1974, both Irigaray and Derrida wrote brilliant works on Antigone, as mourner, when Derrida, through a reading of Hegel on Antigone with Jean Genet, produced a certain queer theory in Gla that was a deconstruction of the signature and the signatory. <clears throat> Deutsch's reading of the cannibalistic mourner, who, through Ferenzi and Freud and Klein and Abraham and Torek, and eventually through Derrida, offers a haunted notion of the subject, a hauntology, as it would become in Spectres of Marx, that fails to fully ingest a lost object, and thus cannot be nourished as self-contained ego, is, um, sorry, that fetishistically ingest a lost object that cannot be nourished as self-contained ego through death an ethics of alterity in which the ego is usefully, even if depressively impoverished, provides an alternative to the masculine as self-same, an encryption of the other that sticks in the throat, that emerges in language to edge against the ontology of oneness while marking the singularity of the other. This thinking of an ontology that cracks the contours of being as self-same, that dominates modern Western philosophy, enters also the thinking of Karen Barad in her essay on touching, which similarly engages the sensation of a certain greeting of the stranger within, and a thinking of the materiality of entering another as a model for questioning the self-same, where the affective and the scientific inevitably bleed into each other in a way that she figures as queer, and electrons become onanistic perversions that eventually eliminate perversion. Each individual, she puts indivi individual in scare quotes, always already includes all possible interactions with itself. 
through all virtual others. Through Haraway, she asks, whom and what do we touch when we touch electrons? Like failed cannibalistic morning, in which one swallows but cannot ingest another in, in, um, in a way that maintains a singularity of the other for which one is responsible, touch for Barad is scientifically an instance in which each of us is constituted as responsible for the other, as being in touch with the other. Like Deutsche, through Derrida and de Rigre, Bar Barad um, thinks through um, uh, Derrida, Levinas, and quantum physics, so responsibility to the other is an instance of ethics. As she writes, quote, ethics is an integral part of the diffraction, ongoing differentiating patterns of worlding, not in superimposing of human values and the ontology of the world. For her, then, it is the inhuman that helps us understand what responsibility entails, because matter is shot through with alterity, an alterity that is demanding of responsibility and a longing for a sense of justice to come. In understanding this question of matter and alterity from Barad and mourning as interruptive of lineage but similarly demanding of responsibility, we can see the complexity of Alondra Nelson's configuration of genetic root-seeking, the genealogical logic of diaspora, and the uses of science in history-making, genetic kinship, and biomedical identity, to use Joseph Dumit's terms she invokes. Nelson's study separates out the effective dimensions of the scientific tests, which are less than definitive on the issue of the geographical origin that is marketed as the desirable object of knowledge. Science then put into the service of a determination of race linked to place raises crucial questions around scale and what this means for an understanding of the complexity of race as scientific fact, as racial epidermal schema, as economic determinant, as genocidal instrument, as system of identification, as kinship pattern, and importantly for Nelson, as affiliative self-fashioning that contribute to an idea that contributes to an idea of communities of obligation configured through scale, sight, and subjectification, she says. If the affiliative potential of failed cannibalism and electrons open the subject to affiliation beyond affiliation, beyond filiation through an ethics of alterity, the genetic genealogical testing opens up affiliative relations through the Podge project of definitive self-fashioning that takes no account of the different meanings of race and their diverse implications for scale. Addressing the story of race through genealogy, through reading these articles together, we see, too, how the question of species always implicitly references a question of sexual difference, and not only through its reproductive and genealog genealogical implications. Reading the basically benign desires of Alondra's, uh, Alondra Nelson's root seekers next to Karen Engel's work on wartime rape and the category of genocidal rape draws attention to the risks of working within an affiliative imaginary that asserts sameness at the expense of difference. In Nelson's subject, the search for uniqueness, identity, roots, and individuality ironically leads to the loss of singularity as one becomes on a different philosophical and ideological, ideological level one of a self-same group who may, for example, seek the status of exemplar through the metonymy of the flag that seems to have implications both for the past and for futurity. Potentially, one can see the seeds there of genocidal logic, even as impurity on the level of DNA testing seems to be an inevitable function of the results of the testing. But nonetheless, within the story of impurity lies still an idea of pure origin, even as that is complicated by histories, too, of course, of sexual violence, of illicit desire, and the confused history of miscegenation laws. Engel's work on rape in wartime, and specifically in the language of genocidal rape in Bosnia and Herzegovina, demonstrates to the manner in which rape, and indeed sex, continues to be understood as forced impregnation among some feminist debates. So debates among feminists exist and continue, existed and continue to exist around how rape should be defined, the status of women as victims and as perpetrators of 
of violence with no room for something beyond that binary. And the question of whether rape on each side was qualitatively different or not, one systematic or even genocidal, the other more akin to understanding rape in war historically as working in the same fashion on all sides. Engels shows how the feminist debate has, unin has un had unintentioned consequences of reinforcing ethnic differences such that, for example, any sex between people on different sides became understood as genocidal and as rape diminishing women's sexual and political agency, and what she calls, quote, degendering sexual violence, understanding rape only as sex and not as an instrument of violence or sexual oppression, when, which, when she suggests it is actually all of these, even if the inverse is not true. In many ways, Engel implicitly asks how we may come to understand who and what is the subject of law beyond the constraints of an idea of a universal rights-bearing citizen and beyond a static notion of difference that precisely evades the complexity of what a difference and a singularity may be in a necessary effort to arrive at some generalizable principles for justice. A singularity then that emerges with and against the generalizable that demands a different ethics of alterity understand, and an understanding of justice. Perhaps an alternative form of hauntology that allows us to think with and against those we fail to cannibalize was, uh, will allow us to continue to understand singularity of a certain kind of work encrypted in a name under erasure. Jose Munoz, Antoinette Fouque, Stuart Hall, to mention some of those who we might understand in an affiliation of the with and against. I want now to turn to my introduction today of Penelope Deutscher, <clears throat> who is going to speak to us about sexual difference and the death penalty, and particularly the death penalty seminars of Derrida. Penelope is the author of four books and many articles, and each consider a terrain of thought made possible through thinking with Sedgwick, Butler, Le Duff, Kaufman, Erigere, Derrida, Beauvoir. She brings a form of deconstructive reading to all of them, consistently thinking with and against. Yielding gender from 1997 asks us to consider the problem of an idea of instability and its limitation in understanding the contradictory meanings of the term woman in the history of Western philosophy. She draws out how gender and heterosexual normativity operate on the strength of the ambiguity of their definition, not their coherence. Yielding gender also speaks to the work of Janet Halley, who, she writes, examines the coher incoherence at the root of US legal judgments that describe homosexuality as at once non-volitional and inherent, and inherent ob abnormality and simultaneously dangerous for the putatively non-heterosexual. Instability rather than stability shape the power of, legal, of the legal systems and in, in her reading that effectively create the fantasy of stability. Incoherence of definition is paradoxically, one might say, untroubling to homophobic law. And it is, this, it is stabilized within that. What then, one might ask, does this imply for our understanding of reason in relation to instability, and how phantasmatically is it produced into existence with detrimental effects and also some useful ones. Her politics of book, her book Politi The Politics of Impossible Difference turns bravely to the late work of Lucy Rigore. She, she, um, she characterizes three, following Rigore herself, she characterizes three phase, phrases of the Rigore project Following Arigure's own schema, the first is decentering the dominance of a masculine perspective. The second is mediations that allow, could allow for feminine subjectivity. And the third, the construction of intersubjectivity such that sexual difference is respected. She shows how Arigure, rather than being an essentialist, forces us into an understanding of the poverty of a politics based on recognition rather than difference. Her granter book, How to Read Derrida from 2005, um, 
really provides a, 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 a very compelling introduction to Derrida. She comes close to um, achieving what seems like an impossibility in some way, a primer that makes use of Derrida's methods um, on him himself through the reading of passages rather than simply providing summary conclusions. Her 2008 book, Philosophy of Simone de Beauvoir, in, in her 2008 book, Deutsche draws out the theorization of an ethics in the writing of Beauvoir such that the givenness of ontological ambiguity becomes the starting point of the givenness of ethical choice. She shows how Beauvoir defends opening oneself to vulnerability, opening up questions, not only from the ethics of ambiguity, which obviously carries that idea in its title, but also from um, um, even less read works like Must Be Burned Sad. Offering a critique of Beauvoir, she also asks us to maintain an interest in the implicit questioning of precarity, vulnerability, and ethics that she nonetheless, nonetheless pursues. Penelope is professor of philosophy at Northwestern University. She's the recipient of many grants and awards and um, has written uh, numerous articles. Please join me in welcoming her today. Her, the title of Penelope's talk is This Death Which Is Not One, and please invite her with me to begin the proceedings of the eighth annual Feminist Theory Workshop. Okay, here we go. You might know or recall that in Derrida's work, there is, as he says, always the telephone. And so it is as in his 99 to 2000 seminar, The Death Penalty. And here he's describing a scene from Clint Eastwood's film, True Crime. The phone call from the governor interrupts the execution in process, saves the innocent one with all the suspense that you can imagine of the cinematic exploitation, which shows all the operations, all the moments of the progression of the fluid, the phone call at the last second, for there's always a telephone today that links like an umbilical cord of life or death, so an umbilical cord of life or death, the place of an execution to the executive power of the sovereign, here that of the governor, who can grant a pardon or interrupt the execution up to the last minute. So the image turns into that of an umbilical cord, which is not one in a film representation of an execution, which turns out not to be one, linking a figure associated with a type of sovereign power, in this case linking an American governor with a place of execution. My question is this, what might we say has taken place in Derrida's work as he turns to such scenes. For Derrida, as for recent writers such as Wendy Brown and Judith Butler, sovereign power is always associated with phantasmatic components, but no less ruthless nor deadly as such. Aspirational um, aspirations to power over life and death, to theological lightness, unquestioned sources of authority, power to the possibility of such decisions. Derrida, as Brown has written, has characteristically shown that sovereign claims are also predicated, dependent, internally divided, vulnerable, not sovereign at all. But for all three writers, Derrida, Brown and Butler, any of the ways in which one might offer an account of the deconstructability of sovereign decisions is not to minimise, to the contrary, the account of their violence or their capacity for the murderous. And so it is with the concurrent deconstructability of the moment of death described by Derrida in the death penalty seminar, suspended, as he stresses it is, for example, between the termination of the heart, the breath, or the brain. And what he describes as a sovereign claim to decide on someone's precise moment of death. So he relates together that sovereign pretension with the undecidability of the moment of death. As someone who's worked for some time with the resources of Derrida and Foucault, I'd like to think this afternoon about the recent publication of Derrida's Death Penalty Seminar as offering an opportunity to revisit their relationship. 
and their ongoing resources for thought, especially those which might arise unexpectedly, I think, from the proximity of both, while also not properly belonging to the resources of either. That's what I'm going to try to propose today in a reading. For you might have already noticed, perhaps, that in Death Penalty, Derrida touches upon one of the foremost associations of sovereign power elaborated by Foucault. In the latter's case, in a differentiating comparison with the formations of biopower, Derrida speaks to the death penalty as the sovereign decision of a power, a sovereign political power, which thereby signals its sovereignty, its sovereign right over souls and bodies, and which in truth defines its sovereignty by this right and by this power over the life and death of subjects, he says. This is how the essence of sovereign power as political, first of all, theologico-political power presents itself, represents itself as the right to decree and to execute a death penalty or to pardon arbitrarily, sovereignly. So a first step into the death penalty seminar might see a context for thinking Foucault and Derrida together in their exploration of this kind of expression of sovereign power. On the other hand, some of Derrida's long-standing resistances to Foucault also seem to manifest again. If Derrida manifests a characteristic form of encouraging praise, advising a full rereading of Foucault's Discipline and Punish in its entirety, he says, as indispensable, and then two years later there's Derrida advising in a similar tone a return to history of sexuality, there's an oscillation between that warmth and an ongoing weariness which seems ill-attuned in its grounds, for one thing, and oddly late in its preoccupations. To Foucault's well-known aside in History of Sexuality I that, quote, he might have taken up the example of the death penalty, Derrida would respond, he responds to that comment, in Beast and Sovereign in 2001, and he responds that even if it's true that a growth in importance and possibility of biopolitics might sometimes have amounted to a decrease in the significance or the prevalence of the death penalty. Says Derrida, what then? He says, you should read closely. There he is with his advice to be reading Foucault closely. You should reread Foucault closely. It's always a should. You should. <laughs> Concerning sovereign power as power of life and death. In the first volume of the history of sexuality, you should read the last chapter entitled Right of Death and Power Over Life. That's where you'll find the austere monarchy of sex that I tried to interrogate and interpret, he says. That's where you'll find an analytic of sexuality that supposedly followed on from a symbolics of blood. So that's where you'll find an analytic of sexuality that supposedly followed on from a symbolics of blood. In passing, Foucault declares that he could have taken at a different level the example of the death penalty. So it's a citation from Discipline and Pun oh, from History of Sexuality, sorry. So he does not take it, continues Derrida, but he explains that he had, and if he had, if he had, he explains that if he had, he would have related the decline of the death penalty to the progress of biopolitics and a power that gave itself the function of managing life. And it's here that Derrida responds, supposing that things are this way and that some decline of the death penalty is principally to be explained by the new advent of biopolitics, which Foucault dates to the end of the classical age. We have to wonder what politico juridical consequence should be drawn. So let's say that that would have been Derrida's question. But even that question gets distracted by a long-standing debate about linear models of power and history, as if Foucault simply would have it that the one-time importance in modes of sovereignty had been progressively replaced by the greater importance, efficiencies, inclusiveness and saturations of discipline, governmentality, biopolitics and security. In Beast and Sovereign, Derrida ascribes to Foucault that temptation of linear history, the image of the threshold, the image of a modernity that comes after the classical age, the epistems that follow on from each other and render each other obsolete. So that would have been Foucault's temptation. And this is one of a number of remarks leaving one inclined to say that Derrida, so typically an attentive reader, often missed Foucault and his encounters with him. 
for Foucault is also thwarting those same linearities, as even Derrida partly acknowledges. So there's a, a wolfiness, a wolfiness in resorting to the least interesting conversation, you might say. Um, the least interesting conversation available, not to mention the point that Derrida also seems to be running so terribly late for Foucault, engaging history of sexuality's monarchy of sex in 1988, uh, and even then not mentioning Foucault's contributions to the specificity of modern politics or biopolitics till 2001, and then not recommending readings of Discipline and Punish till 99, and then in 2001 referring to a Foucauldian problem of epistems that follow on from each other as if rendering each other obsolete, as if that will be the primary debate we'd be having with Foucault, say, in, in 2001. And all of that would be to miss, then, the greater complexity of Foucault's articulations of modern sovereignty. Let's say as a problem of survival of a terminology that Derrida might have been interested in, in its relationship with the biopolitical, sometimes that of a paradoxical relationship, sometimes that of the counterpart, the underside, penetration, persistence, living on. Catching the term threshold, but missing the term persistence, Derrida swings back into proximity with Foucault, but I think misses him again. So let me take a moment closer to the outset of this talk than to the end, to say as clearly as possible how I think Derrida and Foucault might nonetheless almost catch up with each other in thinking about the death penalty. I'm going to suggest that we think of them as linked by the umbilical cord with which I started, the complex interconnection between the pretensions of sovereign power and powers over life and death. But since that umbilical cord was, as you recall, not one, I want to think about the way in which it's also analogical umbilical cords and, appropriately enough, analogical maternities, which become powers of life and death and which come to link Derrida and Foucault. So first, I'm going to follow these cords by starting with the fact that for Derrida and not for Foucault, maternity, an analogical maternity, is important in the history of some arguments for the abolition of the death penalty. And I'll later come back to the point that reflecting on arguments about punishment, one respect in which Derrida and Foucault come into proximity, concerns their scepticism about a form of progressivist, abolitionist argument which associates reform with the promises of enlightenment, teleology, progress, reason, the aspirations of civilization, the human, as opposed to what's contrasted, those unenlightened forms of incarceration and punishment associated with images of barbarism, inhumanity, the extremes of cruelty. It's here that Derrida makes a claim that will not find in Foucault, that's my claim, the proposal that sexual difference is never far from abolitionist discourse about the death penalty. As he says in the opening seminar of Death Penalty, a woman will come to remind us of one of the sexual differences in this truth of the death penalty. And that's so for him in a number of respects. Among them, Derrida will direct interest to a number of confrontations between maternity and the death penalty instances of aversion to the execution of pregnant women. He mentions a point on which signatories to UN treaties um, have been able to agree, disagreeing as they otherwise do on circumstances under which the death penalty might be opposed, yet with various exceptions always, he stresses. But the exception to the exceptions, says Derrida, the exception to the exceptions, has been the execution of pregnant women. And Derrida's commentary here is that it was recommended that the execution of pregnant women be avoided, even where the death penalty was still in force, and everyone joined in this consensus, as if the point were to avoid the horror of this double pen penalty that would take an innocent life and sacrifice one more life, a life to come in the womb of the guilty mother. Finding maternities and sexual differences, Derrida will look at aversions to deaths associated with maternity. He'll mention also a 1901 elimination of the death penalty for mothers guilty of infanticide. He'll explore genderings of the guillotine, the daughter become prostitute, 
then an old woman, a reformed repudiator of execution. It's an image, in fact, of self-improvement from Victor, uh, Victor, Victor Hugo. I'll, I'll stay in Australian. <laughs> Hugo. She wants to lead a better life. This is Hugo speaking of the guillotine. She wants to lead a better life, she who had prostituted herself. She's ashamed of her own profession. She wants to lose her sordid name. Derrida explores the intermittent gendering also of abolitionist concern, depictions of a relentless, cold, uncompassionate, machinic application of the law, resisted by a tender and empathising sympathy, which might be given feminine connotations, douce, gentler, more compassionate. Some traces are found in Badante's writing on abolition. And all of this is a kind of attention, a kind of way of reading, for which it's Derrida, and surely not Foucault, who is particularly apt methodologically. It's true, I think. On the other hand, what I plan to suggest is that Derrida also finds another aspect of sexual difference in play, about which it's actually Foucault who I think had more to say, more than Derrida in some respects. I hope to develop this encounter in that direction by continuing to follow fairly closely Derrida's discussion of Hugo's arguments for abolition. My suggestion is that Derrida confronts a phenomenon in terms which would prompt me, but didn't prompt him, to turn to Foucault. Not just any Foucault, not the Foucaults he did turn to, but the biopolitical Foucault, the Foucault of population and nations, of the administration of life, of birthright, of marsupial mothers, of societies which must be defended, of the conduct of reproduction, of multicorporeal governmentalities, seen when mothers' bodies could enfold promises of life, but also mortal risk, not just to individual lives, but concurrently to the futures they've been considered to enfold, those of peoples and nations. This would, in other words, be to think about the resources that Foucault offered to think the resonances and implications of material that Derrida described as sufficiently abyssal as to hold his attention for years to come. And it could be said that it needed the resources of that term to which Derrida seems to have been so peculiarly averse, the biopolitical. At the same time, there were analytical possibilities that I think he encountered more directly when he considered what you might call a non-Ficodian problem, so to speak, invocations of the sexual difference around the death penalty. And so to move on. I don't need to tell you, I'm sure, that in Derrida's work, there's nothing simple about an analogy. And among the abolitionist writings that he discusses in Death Penalty, I want to look at the analogically saturated images from Hugo, whose ideals of fraternity Derrida had discussed in his 88th seminar, Published as Politics of Friendship. There, Derrida had presented Hugo's image of fraternity as conjoined to an image of the embryo of Europe, ready to expand into the world and the future. It's an imagery which reappears in Hugo's strenuous opposition to the death penalty, an opposition which reaffirmed those distinctions between barbarism and civilization, the hierarchy of peoples, just as much to hand when Hugo spoke of France and its potential as the embryo for globalist expansion. For the death penalty was being presented by abolitionist Hugo as thwarting all the principles he evoked of French progress, as when he wrote in 1829, at the present time, the death penalty is already outside Paris. To leave Paris is to leave civilization. The infamous machine will leave France, it's the guillotine, of course. Let it go seek hospitality elsewhere, from some barbaric people, not from Turkey, which is becoming civilized. Not from the savages who will not want it but let it descend a few more steps on the ladder of civilization. Let it go to Spain or Russia. Did the spirit of progress then not dictate the declaration that he made? This is his own gambit, that the days of the hangman were over. And since civilization amounted to a series of progressive transformations, the vault of the future society will not collapse from not having this hideous keystone, he said. To the contrary, Hugo imagined a light 
finally penetrating the penal code so that to return to that theme developed by Foucault in Discipline and Punish, crime could finally be seen as a matter of illness amenable to cure. With new principles of individual and social health, conjoining ideals of progress and freedom with the identification of crime as malady, this illness, writes Hugo, will have its doctors who will replace your judges. So that's Derrida discussing Hugo, but material that Foucault could have taken up so nicely. So perhaps it's not surprising then that according to this imagery, when an abolitionist spirit was associated with the development of civilization and with the genetic, it was associated with the progress of life, with organic process, with the development of a seed. With Derrida pointing out that Hugo attributes this lifelike progress with a right to life. As if this progress had its own life, its own life claims on those who would impede it. And that's one kind of rhetorical support that Hugo gave to abolitionism, and another was a fundamental right to life, the principle invoked by Hugo of the inviolability of human life. That was a second kind of support. But there was a third support to which Hugo appeals, and it's here that the gendering manifests itself most honest, obviously, that of, in many senses, a woman who's not one. Hugo invites us to think about how a woman can sometimes be a conscience. For example, the execution of a woman is particularly abhorrent, he says, so much so that it starkly brings into view the barbarism, the retarded state of the civilization tolerating it, and any death penalty. This is the sense in which women, for Hugo, are calls to conscience. There's the conscience reminding us of the principles of life, and there's a principle and technique of life which women simply constitute, which they are, and they're both of those things. They become both of those things for Hugo. So interesting here is the overlap of the death penalty, which here is serving to divide peoples into high and low, and the analogical status of women. They also take on a kind of vitality from a biopolitical perspective. They're figures not just of the moral conscience of progress, but also of its procreation. They're both literal and they're figural. They are rendered, one wants to say literally, reproductively vital, not only in Hugo's imagery, not only Hugo's imagery, to France, to its expansion, to colonialism, to the future of Europe, in a coincidence of the dissemination of reproductive life, the life of populations, national futures, progress, civilization, its qualities of compassion, all associated with the embryo of peoples. Now, let me just take one step back into Foucault again. For Foucault, you'll recall, it's the seeming transition of sovereign powers, decisive and spectacular powers over life and death to the more efficient and distributed, optimising administrations of life, understandable as biopower, which seem to produce a new kind of scandal or contradiction with the death penalty. But if, as he says, there have been times when, in conjunction, fewer and fewer die on the scaffold, Foucault invited us to exchange the explanation in terms of a new awakening of humanitarian feelings, whose discourse is certainly omnipresent for a recognition of new distributions and techniques of power which proliferate in relation to a new governmental object, ensuring, sustaining, multiplying life. Moreover, he was the first to say, and did say at the outset of this discussion and consistently, it might also be that such biopolitical techniques don't stimulate a decrease in execution, given that they've also been associable with killing, massacre, war, and genocide. Those might even proliferate in biopolitical contexts, but where they do so, then these would be characteristically associated with new modes, new justifications. Not necessarily the exercise of sovereign right, but rather new life, order, defence, principles of safeguarding, principles of well-being, principles of health. And this, in fact, is the point about which Foucault had commented that he might have chosen the example of the death penalty. So that's, that was the nature of that remark, to make that point. <laughs> 
Now, what interested Foucault is that these might be the very same principles which manifest in reform and arguments for abolitionism. And what then, we can ask, is the example to be found in Hugo? It's the image of civilization's retardation by the death penalty in an, sorry, an emblematically abhorrent execution of the woman associated with reproductive life. That woman whose reproductivity has become a concurrently literal and symbolic figure, a figure of vitality, of well-being, of growth, the very principle of life and expansion for the future of France, Europe, colonialism. In this image, it's as if all the women are potentially pregnant with the future of all of Europe, all of civilization itself, as if all the women can be thought in terms of an umbilical cord, securing in all these senses life, countering a threat of death which is ever lurking or decline, depopulation, peoples, colonialism, civilization, collective and expansionist futures, life, embryos, given all these senses, populations, collective, national, were here being encompassed in the corporeal space of the reproductive woman. And that reproductive woman is, I think, importantly, nameless. And so here's Hugo. A frightening question is posed. A woman named, what does the name matter? A woman is condemned to death. Now, let us examine this. Shoot a woman. Shooting a man, that's understandable. Man to man, these things are done. That's, of course, not his view, but he's arguing from the point of hyperbole that the woman's the emblem of the worst of it. You might shoot a man. Shooting a man, these things are done. It's in the order of things, not in the natural order, but it's in the social order. But shooting a woman. It's Derrida, not Foucault discussing Hugo on this point in Death Penalty. But isn't it Foucault in the Collège de France lectures from 73 to 8 who considered these curious temporalities and compressed corporealities that biopoliticised populations and their reproductivities, aims, securities, spaces and logics become? Once in a lecture, Foucault observed the interest in the conduct of women's bodies as both individual responsabilisation of breastfeeding and massifying concern about the collective tendencies or rates of breastfeeding in populations. At length, he thought about children's bodies made a subject of harm and as concurrently vector of harm to collective vitalities, futures and nations, populations, peoples, as children and their parents, more specifically mothers in fact, assumed what he called a biological moral responsibility for staving off individual, collective, national and future deaths and decline, variously understood from less than optimal upbringing associated with an individual's early death or sapped vitality. And concurrently, it's the same thing, and this is the point, with the sapped vitality of a population. The transmissions of degeneracy that he discussed his images into the seventh, seventh generation, the counter images of nervous or hysterical women as bad mothers, and most importantly, as Foucault names it once in History of Sexuality, the feminine body's organic communication with the social body whose regulated fecundity it was supposed to ensure. That's a passage from History of Sexuality. He described these individual bodies as enveloping the life and the death of peoples and populations. But it's for Derrida that there's a question here, as there's not for Foucault. The one that Derrida described as worthy of commentary for years to come, so much so that economic considerations would oblige him to do no more than cite it. And that was the passage referring him to his earlier discussion of Hugo in Politics of Friendship. And it arose when the death penalty brings Hugo, and not a few others, to confront the question of, quote, the mother, the woman, and sexual difference. The passage is Hugo's case against the death penalty as manifesting in shooting a woman. I think the problem confronted here belongs not exactly to Derrida. It's the biopolitical interest in life which seems to make the death penalty less plausible. 
And I think the problem belongs not exactly to Foucault. Now it's sexual difference, which is seen to inflict that very implausibility in the overlap of the biopoliticised woman as a new kind of principle of life whose long-standing association with reproductivity takes on new significance as power and its modern techniques, quote, takes charge of men and women as living bodies. Rather than, I like to think that the problem is dislodged in an unexpected space that widens out and is framed or elaborated by Foucault and Derrida. It could be seen as a place arising from points of proximity between them. It could be seen as arising also from repulsions between them. I think a problem is dislodged from Derridian and Foucauldian resources in a way that one imagines neither of them anticipating, and that's not part of a conversation between them that one can easily imagine. I think then, to put it another way, that the umbilical cord mentioned by Derrida, linking an execution to a sovereign who can deliver life and death, and that other umbilical cord, which allegorically allows the woman to become the emblem of the abhorrence of the death penalty, its impediment to the progress of life and its expansionist biopolitical future. I think those are two umbilical cords that can hold together the analyses of Derrida and Foucault. And I'll just say, if you're tired, and know that there's a lot to come, and already that seems enough. That actually is the argument, and you could stop there. <laughs> In the remainder of this paper, I'm just going to make that same argument with just a little bit more detail, but that's more or less it. In a number of publications and projects around a six-year period from 94 on, a phenomenon seemed to occur in Derrida's work. As texts and contexts such as politics and friendship, beast and sovereign, rogues, lectures given, and so on, considered images of political sovereignty, they tended to comment on the importance of sexual difference. So as he talked about political sovereignty through this period, he often talked about sexual difference, or he mentioned it, he cited it. At the same time, because the problem that would have taken him decades, and what, what do you do faced with that kind of economic problem? You cite something, you name it, you say it. So the problem of sexual differences there, and at the same time reiterated as they are in these comments about voyut and visors, the sex of animals, all of these comments always seem to meet a stall. So there's a countering. There's a kind of complication of sexual difference that's obviously hovering, even haunting, these accounts of sovereignty, rogues, wolves, and political friendships. But this sexual difference is, as a theoretical articulation, I'll say now, surely not one. An intervention which at best is taking place by not quite taking place. But in fact, there's another aspect hovering through Derrida's reflections on political sovereignty, a recurring speculation about the role of analogy whether he's discussing the analogies between friendship and political union in politics of friendship, between fraternity and political union in that work and also in rogues, between sovereigns and rogues, uh, whether, it's between the whether it's the analogies between beasts and sovereigns in his seminar of that name. If sovereignty becomes a problem for Derrida, calling somehow to sexual difference, it also becomes a problem of analogy. And it becomes a problem of analogy as a problem. Now again, I don't need to tell you that he's repeatedly interrogating the status of any possible literality versus the analogical. For some of you, that just goes without saying, I know, but particularly in politics of friendship, Derrida formulates one outcome from that use of analogy. With respect to fraternal images of political association, such as the collective political sovereignty formed by those who participate in constituted political associations, those uh, formed by virtue of birth or natural right, Derrida notes of the image of fraternity that the brothers' bonds are avowed as non-literal and yet at the same time as more literal or pseudo-literal than is entirely avowed. The bond of fraternity uniting citizens therefore takes on both a concurrently pseudo-metaphorical and pseudo-literal status. If the image makes those forming a political body like brothers, we're to understand that this is a fraternity beyond fraternity, a fraternity without fraternity, he knows, literal, strict, genealogical, masculine, and so on. 
Yet as Derrida comments in Politics and again in Rogues, the figure can't pretend to be entirely figurative because it specifically doesn't include the sisters, the daughters or the mothers and historically served to exclude them often violently. And if fraternity is merely a figure, surely the sister ought to be able to offer a case of the brother perfectly well. But in the tradition of political association and thought, the sister's not considered substitutable, let alone substituted, for the brother. So their very exclusion is calling uneasy attention to the concurrently pseudo-literal and pseudo-metaphorical status of fraternity. So this is from Rokes. In fraternalism or brotherhoods, in the confraternal or fraternalising community, what is privileged is at once the masculine authority of the brother, who is also a son, a husband, a father, genealogy, family, birth, autochtony, and the nation. And any time the literality of these implications has been denied, for example, by claiming that one was not speaking of the natural and biological family, says Derrida, as if the family was ever natural and biological, or that the figure of the brother was merely a symbolic and spiritual figure, it was never explained, Derrida's continuing, why one wished to hold on to and privilege this figure rather than that of the sister, the female cousin, the daughter, the wife, or the stranger, or the figure of anyone or whoever. So we see, I'm going to suggest, a similar phenomenon of putatively non-literality possessing a complex pseudo-literal status that's concurrently disavowed, repeating in the images that I've discussed here relating maternity, national unity and birth. The nation and its constitutive bonds are given the metaphorics of birth when ego's humanity as a nation refers not only to the fraternal continent, to man as brother, to the embryogenesis of the French nation of the future, but also describes the colonialist glory of the French nation radiating over all continents like a family. The references we earlier saw to citizens being born to the nation, to the nation of brothers who are collectively the fetus born of Paris, France, the mother, the nation, those images are analogical in just this concurrently pseudo-literal and non-literal sense. They intertwine, of course, with a biopolitical in the activity, a biopolitical interest in the activity of mothers, in the reproduction of mothers. And so I want to recall here Foucault's reference to the woman's body placed in organic communication with the social body. Let's say that women come to guarantee as mothers and mothers, both the symbolic or analogical relationship between the brothers, but also what looks like a concurrently literal or pseudo-literal relationship they are reduced to a maternal role when political arguments for the exclusion of women from the fraternity then uh, refer to their invaluable maternal contribution to the nation. And if that is a maternity which is not one, in a fraternity which is not one, then Derrida might have wanted to suggest that that is possible because we've only always been dealing with an analogy which is not one. So to begin to sum it up, what you've heard today is the background against which I would hope to situate just one aspect of Derrida's death penalty seminar. I'd mentioned my interest in spaces that widen out perhaps through the forces of mutual repulsion at points where Foucault and Derrida seem almost to touch. And let me mention just one more. Because it happens that death penalty takes up a problem confronted by Foucault. When Derrida tends to think of a sovereign power, not just associated with the right to take life and dispose of bodies, but also a form of sovereignty which may abolish the death penalty, yet retain the right, perhaps all the more vigorously, to send populations to war or to wage forms of civil war, or retain the means to impose putatively less cruel and more compassionate forms of the death penalty, forms that Derrida will call anaesthetised death penalties. Arriving at a parallel point in the midst of the divergences on how to theorise, let's say, subjects, sovereigns, teletechnologies, I mentioned that they share their scepticism about the particular forms of aspiration to progress, enlightenment, science, compassion and humanism evoked by Hugo, which might manifest in arguments for reforms of punishment understood as brutal or barbaric, inhuman or unenlightened. <laughs> 
Foucault had seen in the modern truth-seeking enlightened subject, who understands that crime and madness are matters of health, just one of the vital links in the far more extensive techniques and possibilities for correction, adjustment, self-adjustment, and he argues even indirect murder, stimulated by the broader, inclusive and extensive networks of discipline, normalisation, gritting, self-surveillance and the biopolitical. Those sceptical readings meet somehow, or they come pretty close, in the reference of both to Beccaria, the abolitionist of the 18th century with Derrida, and legal theorist, with Derrida, Derrida pointing out that Beccaria's argument for abolition foregrounded as less cruel and more human was in fact an argument for an alternative. The alternative to the death penalty was lifelong imprisonment and even Beccaria concurrently names that as from a different perspective, crueler in fact. But also as operating more effectively, he says, as a, as a deterrent, given that all would be conscious that the prisoner's fate is, as he saw it, worse than death. Representation, therefore, can be more terrifying than death. And he says that this representation is more terrifying than death, the image of um, perpetual incarceration. One must choose, he says, the least cruel means that will act on the body of the criminal. And that means to choose what will, at the same time, leave the most lasting impression on the minds of the people. So again, it's an argument against the death penalty. He's saying one must choose the least cruel um, means, the least cruel in terms of acting on the body of the criminal, but one must choose the means that's going to leave the most, the most lasting impression on the minds of the people. And perhaps catching each other for just one moment, this is the very same point that finds itself cited by both Foucault in Discipline and Punish and Derrida in The Death Penalty. Now, for his point, Derrida takes from this point a route through the ever-conditional forms of abolitionism, noting how extensively death penalties might be challenged as archaic, brutal, primitive, cruel, ineffective in a negotiation of extensive alternatives, exceptions, conditions and possibilities for death penalties in lieu of unconditional opposition, which you never see, he argues, reminding for example, that the 74 Furman versus Georgia ruling suspending capital punishment as cruel and unusual under the Eighth Amendment could, at the same time, allow the later reinstatement once its process could be claimed to comply with the Eighth Amendment. That is the approach to abolitionism that Derrida can generalise as the anesthetised death penalty. And since he'll attend to arguments in the name of the progressive of distance from what's othered, if not nationalised, as brutal, savage and other, locating the principles of redivision, the demarcation of the archaic other, primitive, cruel and barbaric, the pre-European, to which the death penalty seems more proper as belonging to another time or other cultures, uncivilised. All those representations just as easily intertwined his stresses with the very justifications for colonialism and war that you might think they'd oppose, but to the contrary is his point. And so says Derrida, different variations of the death penalty manifest with abolitionism and precisely in the name of civilisation. So he attends to the way in which abolitionism, so often in the name of civilisation, can leave the door open, not closed, to those anesthetised versions of the death penalty, which might come to seem consistent with the pretensions to civilisation. In a number of ways then, adherences and disadherences to death penalties become dividing principles, divisions of peoples. But what's that role played by Derrida's point? So characteristically his point that sexual difference is somehow at work in these concerns. It's here that in turning back to the politics of friendship and to that first appearance of Victor Hugo, we found that problem that in his way I suggested Foucault was also interested. So here are three principles developed by Hugo. They all concern progress and they all concern women. First principle, fraternity. Developing the theme of fraternity, Victor Hugo proposed an image of Paris, capital of fraternity, and it's here that Derrida, not Foucault, is interested, you might remember, in what seems to be a problem of analogy, birth metaphors. This is the image of the future that Hugo argues is gravely harmed by the death penalty. 
It is certain that the French Revolution is a beginning. Take note of this word, birth. It corresponds to the word deliverance. O oh, France, adieu. One separates from one's mother who becomes a goddess and you, France, become the world. Second principle is the principle of progress into the future. This fraternal continent is associated with the profound ovaries of progress. That's his image. <laughs> Under the influence of this motive nation, the incommensurable fallow lands of America, Asia, and Australia, Africa, will give themselves up to civilization, civilizing immigration. The central nation whence this movement will radiate over all continents will be to other societies what the model farm is among tenant farms. So here's the third principle, radiating expansion, growth. It will be more than a nation. It will be better than a civilization. It will be a family and the capital of this nation will be Paris. Here we see what Hugo also called, as you recall, that embryogenesis of peoples. And this was how a fraternity could be seen as the fetus of nations, connecting sexual difference in a number of ways with sovereign biopolitical and colonial aspirations in those profound ovaries of progress of this fraternal aspirational image towards an open nation that Hugo promised, this is another citation, would welcome one day anyone who was brotherly. We saw why and how Derrida can claim that to name all this as fraternity will be to suppose the complex, simultaneously literal and analogical status of fraternity. So what happens here to women's reproductivity and how can we understand that also as the principle of expansionism into the future? Most obviously, we can say that the reproductive here is not only a metaphor, so to speak, and that it comes into contiguity, in fact, I think unsurprisingly, with a number of rights claims. Abolitionist claims, to be sure, those we've seen, claims to freedom, but in the end, also women's rights. Because it happens that Hugo was approached by an American-based group of women, American-based group of feminists, the Society for the Improvement of the Condition of Women who in 1875 had written him to ask for an expression of support. And he responded affirmatively, agreeing that women indeed suffered in contemporary society. And he pointed out in support of the feminist cause. And who says woman, says child, that is the future. It was considered important to the future of the radiating nation that Hugo imagined <coughs> that women bore children, to be sure. But perhaps we could say that it's also as biopoliticised that women could become anal analogised figures. The biological space of bearing and raising the children was also a reworking of the times and spaces of their bodies, so that in reproducing they could be seen as bearing the political space of the future. Women were the children of the future because they were the mothers of the future. They unfolded the possible spaces of the future. Pursued by Derrida, that becomes a problem of claims which profit from a concurrent and very elaborate literal, pseudo-literal and analogical status. If we were willing to understand analogy in an infinitely complex way. But pursued by Foucault, it has to become a different kind of problem, one concerning the complex multiplicities of biopower, the intersections of discipline, the biopolitical security, persisting forms of sovereignty, or stimulating bodies with differently multiple and elastic characters, enfolding individual and population promises and threats of degeneracy, of fears and defences against multiple forms of death in life, so that reproduction from conduct to birthright could also be colonial expansion, so that its conduits could offer both promise and harm to the future hopes of nations and peoples. And that's the organic communication between body and social body okay, between body and social body, that I think you'll be the first to tell me, isn't a problem of analogy in Foucault's work, so much as of material corporealities, which can both conflict and coincide as the many vectors of so many te techniques of power. As he wrote of the many forms of governmentality, they could be multiple, they could superimpose, they could cross and impose their own limits, and sometimes cancel one another out, and sometimes reinforce one another. I think for Foucault, the intersection of reproduction, expansion, and the taking of life 
will become a complex interconnection of governmentality of life in all of these different kinds of ways, ranging from the sovereign to the biopolitical. For Derrida, the problem of analogy, literality and pseudo-literality, the deconstruction of the literal, which will remind us that life, biology, reproduction, genealogy is always a matter of difference. This is the Derrida who would remind us that there were no natural mothers, nor brothers, that a genealogical tie would never be simply real. This is a citation from Politics of Friendship, which I don't have. Oh. So this is the Derrida who would remind us that there were no, no, no natural mothers, no natural brothers, that, quote, a genealogical tie will never be simply real. Its supposed reality, he says, never gives itself in any intuition. It's always posed, constructed, induced. It always implies a symbolic effect of discourse. Is it a proximity or a repulsion to think here the Foucault, for whom the interest in reproductive space involves a number of multiplicities of bodies, masses and micropowers, family, institution, norms, gridded, comparative, inclusive, tracked aggregates of bodies and bodies become organic masses, governed, predictive and securitised entities named populations in that communication of body and social body? Is it the point of proximity where we see the specificity of resources of Derrida and Foucault, perhaps? the different senses in which a reproductive body could be at the same time an individual body and a body enfolding the time and the space and the visions of the future of nations, of the French. Expansionism, radiation, and the deaths threatening that expanded aspiration. And the mothers representing both that life and that death. And the mothers enfolding the organic masses of the populations. My suggestion's not that analogy is a particularly helpful term for Foucault, in the same way as it clearly is for Derrida, in thinking about what, in fact for both of them, is the biopolitical. But rather my suggestion is that what for Derrida becomes most intensely, I think, a problem of analogy, finds its point of closest conversation in the concurrently micro and macro spaces of a child, a woman, breastfeeding, scrutinising, marsupial or Malthusian mother, whose pregnancies are also birth rates, and bodily futures and national futures, those elaborated by Foucault. At this point of contact between Derrida's capacity to think the simultaneously literal and analogical, and Foucault's capacity to think together these multiple corporeal spaces and times which coincide and conflict, which jostle and enfold each other, is a form of materiality that they both articulate and it's one in which I'm particularly interested. And that's it, thank you.